Hello and welcome to an Infinity the Game Reinforcements Battle Report. As a caveat on this video, as with my previous battle report featuring the reinforcement rules, we are making heavy use of many assumptions about how the profiles work and how the reinforcements mechanic works, all based on what has been spoiled in the on tabletop videos featuring Carlos Bostria, published over the course of the last week. Nevertheless, these games have been a really interesting experiment and kind of a taster or a teaser getting ready to start thinking about what can go on in these games and how the reinforcement mechanic will change things with the obvious caveat that we just haven't seen everything yet and there's a lot still to be explored and revealed. Now, in the previous game, I played Hackerslam versus Combined Army. Those were experiments in what I felt were some of the strongest potential reinforcement and list options in the potential reinforcement meta. In this game, I'll be playing against Bakunin, which I think probably does perform quite well, but it has a interestingly fragile but useful reinforcement pool, but I would be playing with Starco. And I have a few reasons for playing with Starco. Uh, two of them I'll cover now as we look at the list. So this is the list that I would run this evening. Uh, and the first reason why I chose to play Starco is that you can build a reinforcement list uh, in Starco just using profiles that are in Starco. The Anaconda with AP Spitfire, the Digger, the CSU, and the Brawler Hacker. Now, these are not necessarily profiles that will be available as reinforcements. I wouldn't be surprised, for example, if the Anaconda got a reinforcement-specific profile, but just for the purposes of experimentation, I can play and use these all in the app without having to like load photos on my phone and refer to those during play. So yes, the first motivation I had for playing Star Starco in this particular game is good old-fashioned laziness. The second reason that I played Starco this evening is because I am kind of of the opinion, noting that there's very, very little information about what the contracted backup reinforcement profiles will be like, that contracted backup is probably the weakest reinforcement pool. Uh, although the extra SAMHSA does seem pretty cool and interesting, uh, they are only available to two armies, both as a reinforcement profile and as a regular profile, and that leaves the remaining contracted backup pool thoroughly anemic. Like, it's really bad. There's nothing good in there, with the sole exception of diggers who are a maybe. And the reason why there's a big asterisk over diggers as a reinforcement profile is that we haven't seen any impetuous reinforcement profiles yet, and if you can get an impetuous reinforcement profile, that will be really good, because impetuous and reinforcements is just a match made in heaven. Being able to just slap a discounted close assault troop down in the middle of the table and then immediately impetuous for effect is very, very strong, which is why I actually wonder if there will even be impetuous reinforcement profiles. Will Duroc be impetuous in his reinforcement incarnation? Will Diggers as reinforcement troops be impetuous? We'll have to see. It's an open question. Uh, there's no reason to suggest that they won't, but it's just something that I will be paying attention to to see when they release. Uh, so the digger really is the like shining glory of this reinforcement pool. The rest of it is really not outstanding. Uh, and in fact, having now played this game, I kind of feel like this would have been a case where I would have been probably better off not playing with reinforcements. 300 points of actual stuff would probably have been better than this 350 point list because this is not a good 100 points worth of stuff. And the way I had to thin my list out, and again, we aren't even playing with a comm link here, so I have not given up a troop slot for a comm link. This feels real, real weak. Uh, the rest of the list is a bunch of things that I have wanted to play with Starco. I don't play Starco particularly often. They're not a faction that's familiar to me, but these are things that Starco, ha Starco has that are cool, that I would like to use, and since I'm playing Starco, it's an opportunity to try them out. So we have uh, a Haris linked now, which is really, really nice. Um, it's a very cheap Haris link. You have a Doctor and an Alguacil behind him, and that just gives him plus one burst. I don't know if it strictly turns him into a viable ARO piece because he's so much more dangerous in active turn. Uh, but in this case, I had very little choice. I played him as an ARO piece. But the fact that you can, it's much better to play him as a linked ARO piece than an unlinked ARO piece is really interesting. We then have a potential five-man link, although I would be very comfortable playing this as three or four troopers. And that starts with the Riot Girl Spitfire, Uhahu and or the Digger, and Avicenna. You can bolt in Emily and or Uhahu and a Digger to get up to five troopers if you want to. I think Emily can wild kind of do that. I didn't play her in that link, and I'm not actually sure she can, but she probably can. But really what's going on in particular is 
Avicenna, the Riot Girl, and the Digger. This is a lot like actually the Riot Girl utility link that you'll have seen featured in some Bakunin lists played by my opponent this evening, actually. Uh, and I really like that. And I can take that list and I can exchange Fiddler for a Digger to get a very, very lean, efficient three-person assault team that I really liked and wanted to play. We also have two Hellcats. And Every list built for reinforcements that I have seen so far has pieces that can close assault the enemy in their deployment zone as quickly as possible without spending orders because you just don't have any orders in this format at the moment playing the game without comlink plus one, comlink plus two, comlink plus three. And Hellcats can fill that role. Are they as good as Hassassin for days or Brander Castro? No, they're not remotely close, but they aren't bad either. They land on 15s, they have boarding shotguns, and they only cost 24 points. And that felt like it could be kind of a good fit. Uh, in the first version of this list, I actually had a Spitfire Hellcat before I realized I had completely miscounted my SWC split across the groups and that you have to have f um, two SWC in your reinforcements, five in your primary list. Uh, and I, I just messed it up slightly. So I would love to have a Spitfire Hellcat in there, but I didn't. Although I will say, uh, in six SWC, paying one SWC for an Alguacil sucks. In five SWC, it really sucks, like a lot. Uh, you could make up those that SWC by exchanging the Dactari and the Alguacile for uh, two Brawlers, for example, one of whom is a Lieutenant, but that's, that's, again, then you don't have a Doctor for now unless you have Avicenna nearby, etc., etc. Uh, finally, just to make points, we have a Hawa Forward Observer. You can do some special, do some um, missions, which in Frontline, which is what we'll be playing, is kind of relevant. Um, and his god job really is just to swap, swap into the first combat group uh, as soon as I take some casualties. Now, at that point, we go, ah, oh, that all seems pretty good, but it's it's very very limited, and the reason why it's very limited is you can you look at all the things that are there. And I am actually really enthusiastic about playing them. I like a lot of the things that are present here. But then you look at the things that are not present. There is no picket defense. There is no close-in template weapons that can discourage a model like Branda Castro. There is no smoke. I am totally reliant on these limited number of guns to push my way forward. Uh, there's no missile, even though we've got a picture, because there just isn't an SWC for it. There are so many things missing from this list. Uh, if I could build a tighter reinforcement group, I would love to get, for example, a hard case in there. But with the profiles that are available presently uh, for diggers, CSU, brawlers, etc., I just wasn't sure how to make a reasonably effective three trooper list, even with tactical awareness from the Anaconda, to free up those troop slots. So the limits really, really began to be felt. Uh, and that's why I sort of say, I think this list might have been better as a 300 point list than a 350 point reinforcement list. Because these are not great, and this is not great, and this could just not be a reinforcement profile. And if you cut all of this stuff out, then you can add in, just for example, a couple, you could add in Senior Masakare uh, and a couple of Jaguars and a hard case, and that would come in at very approximately 50 points. You could balance some things around. And if you did that, you would have things that could stop what was going to happen to me on the first turn. Uh, and with that foreshadowed, let's jump through to my opponent's list. So this is a Bakunin list run by my opponent, Rob. Uh, some of you will know him as Inane Imp, either on the forums or on Discord. Uh, quite accomplished Bakunin player, has been in Canberra for a little while now. Uh, and this list I like. This list, uh, Rob described it as basically his standard go-to current Bakunin list, but with 50 points of approximate fat trimmed out and some sacrifices made and getting an entire reinforcement pool for that. Now, once again, there is no, um, there's no comlink profile present here. We don't know exactly how all of these things will work. Work. We have continued to play with ITS Season 13, or whatever the current season is, rules for Takamotos remotes, which means that this Stemplazond and Pywell uh, would have marksmanship and tactical awareness. But having now seen a Stemplazond land as part of reinforcements, I do wonder if that will persist <laughs> into the next season. I kind of suspect not. Otherwise, this is a really nice, really lean, really effective Bakunin list that does not sacrifice too much necessarily for reinforcements. Uh, we have a five-person link of Zoe and Pywell, two moderators, one of whom is the LT, and a Cyclone Fairback. Uh, Cyclone Fairback provides a picture, etc. Could this be something else? Yes, feasibly. Could it be a Riot Girl? Yes, feasibly. Does a Cyclone do some things that are interesting and be more powerful and active, which would be very relevant this game? Yes. We have Robin Hook. 
excellent, bit expensive, but quite good. Uh, Stigmaton, excellent tag. We have a Vertigo Zond, we have guided missiles in this list. We've got guided missiles combining with pitches and more pitches, which we'll get to. And then a Chimera, which is excellent and has 10 orders behind it. And Branda Castro. Uh, Branda Castro, things like Hellcats, things like um, Fides and Branda Castro are looking like they'll be very, very, not necessarily powerful, although they will be powerful. There'll be fewer things that can defend against them, but just necessary because it's so difficult to attack in the way we are familiar with, with a small order pool. Whereas in this case, Brand can absolutely do work. He doesn't have to cross the table uh, that in a way that would like expose him to risk or potentially get him stalled halfway out. Then in group two, and I love this, we have a war core. Three points, cool, fills out a combat group slot, offers a little bit of uncertainty about what things could be, not in hidden deployment, I don't suspect a prowler, but you know, there could be initiate drop troop if, uh, if you know, in the wings. Now for the reinforcement pool, uh, obviously the zero and the initiated are proxy elements in the uh, in the list just to fill points. Uh, they are a hacker and an engineer. The engineer is the Mars spider engineer, and the hacker is the whatever the not awesome NCO marksman profile is. I can't remember the troop type, but it's a killer hacker, uh, and it forms a link with the cyclone and the stempler, which gives you a tactical awareness link. Uh, again, not sure that will persist into reinforcements, but a tactical awareness link. And the cyclone here, I really really like because it gives um, a pitcher that appears in the midfield and a 360 visor, Spitfire, like all of the things. 33 points for the cyclone. You have to spend your points on reinforcements somewhere, and 33 points for this Cyclone doesn't feel quite so bad when you can deploy it in a perfect position to place pitches. Wow, that was an alliterative sentence. Um, deploy it in a perfect position to place pitches and otherwise just make use of those Spitfire range bands. So this list I like. It has a little bit of like ablative defense in the form of a really good force reconstitution thanks to Pywell can go down and be repaired. The Cyclone can go down and be repaired. Uh, even the... Um, Stigmaton, if it goes down, you can put one of these Zonbots sort of like back near it to make the run towards Stigmaton to repair it when the um, the engineer turns up. So this list I quite like. It's also very good at doing classifieds. I think Rob would do all three of the classifieds that he didn't um, pitch for Intelcom in this scenario. I uh, just generally quite like this list. So we would be playing Frontline. Frontline is another scenario that has the potential to act, interact in like a very interesting way with reinforcements because it's all about seizing ground at the end of the game. Uh, and let's jump to the table. So we're rolling Whip 13 versus Whip 13 Lieutenants. Uh, I fail and Rob thinks about it for a little bit and then decides to go first. And at that point, I kind of inwardly cringe because my list is just really not set up to defend. It, it just has, it has nothing, it has nothing that can defend. It has nothing that, it has nothing that I would call like a designated casualty, nothing that can survive and attack. Um, and an attack, and so it's like, all right, you know what? Maybe we'll just we'll just get lucky. But I I've realized that at this point, that based on how my list is written, I have no choice but to present hard arrows. I I can't hide because there's an Uberfall Commando over there. I have to pin her back. We'll jump through Rob's reserved Rob's deployments, but to note, his reserves were Brander Castro and the Stigmaton. So Rob has uh, over here, we have Robin Hook who rolls up plus four armor, uh, the war correspondent right on the deployment zone edge. The Stigmaton is going to reserve drop down here. The Uber 4 Commando is in this building on the ground floor. And then the five man core link is all situated around here. We have uh, on the ground level, we have one moderator, another moderator here. And then we have uh, Pywell is all going to be on the ground floor here underneath this elevator. Zoe is there and the Cyclone Fwerback is there. We also have uh, hanging out back here, we have the um, missile launcher, the Vertigo Zond. It doesn't quite have a look across the entire table, but it is watching, you know, like some decent lines there and there. For my part, I make the decision, having not seen the Stigmaton yet, to deploy the Riot Goal standing. I actually suspect that there's a Stigmaton coming, but with those Uber 4 Commando deployed, I just need to pin them back slightly. I figure if a Stigmaton drops, I'm dodging on 16s, I have Abyssiana, it's not the end of the world. Uh, because of the, the threat that the pitches on the Fwerback Cyclone present, uh, I haven't seen a KHD, but I'm sure there'll be one around somewhere. Rob will always take a KHD if he suspects he needs to play a hacking game. Uh, so Uhahu is hanging out all the way back here, as far as possible from the Cyclone. We have a Digger on the ground floor here, and then Abyssiana is hanging out down here. In particular, I'm pretty sure she's in a position where if she needs to, she can jump using her six inch of movement onto this rooftop. Over here, we have uh, hanging out way in the back, we have the Alguacile Lieutenant, we have the uh, Commit the Doctor here and then Nalf standing here with some pretty good lines of fire. 
basically watching all of this space, and that's going to let him fight the Cyclone, which is actually pretty favorable. Three dice tens versus two dice thirteens is a little bit of a coin flip. You can very easily win that with two dice thirteens. Finally, we have my turret here. Uh, Rob's turret is in the building there. It will not take many shots during the game. And then Emily Handelman is here. I don't love this deployment of Emily. She's not in a link. She doesn't benefit from it hugely for her spec fire. But I've positioned her because I want her to be able to bombard this link team. The spec fire is another one of those things where it's an attack that you can make without spending lots of orders crossing the table. Um, what I don't like is the fact that Emily is so close to my chain of command. She's my chain of command. I have only one lieutenant and she's very close to my LT, which is a risk. And it's particularly a risk because down drops Brander Castro alongside the uh, alongside the Stigmaton. Uh, my Hawa is down here, and then the game begins. Now, this is going to be a pretty open table. Rob tends to build tables that are pretty open. Uh, it's not terribly open, and it does have, it has one thing that's going to be very, very important if you're doing table design. Uh, if you're going to have a kind of open table, you want to have something like this. You want to have a big piece in the middle of the table that just means that these rooftops don't have perfect line of sight to each other. But as it is, it's still doing the thing that tables like this tend to do, which is that if you imagine like the space that is blocking line of sight between these rooftops, it's literally just this, right? Imagine a, an infinity table that has one piece of terrain. That is what these rooftop to rooftop fights are like. So there's just going to be gunfighting that happens. Rob kicks off his impetuous with the Chimera moving forward. And because I've got an elf position there, we actually knock out, and the right girl here, we actually knock down two of the Pupniks, uh, but it's not hugely concerning. Um, there are some decisions. Rob actually probably would have walked that back if he'd realized I had line of sight into this building through this doorway you can just see there with the, um, the right girl. But ultimately, the Chimera is not lost, so he presses on with the turn. From here, for me, this turn is going to suck. Um, I have presented a hard ARO plus some like good dodges in the hopes of stalling out Rob's turn, but he has plenty of tack. He has 12 orders down to 10 thanks to his tack aware, and this is going to be rough. So in no particular order, the things that are going to happen is that the Stigmaton is going to put the Riot Girl unconscious in one order. The Fuerback is going to put Nalf unconscious in one order. Brander Castro is going to yeet up and across here. And I'm able to do my AROs in a way that stall him out reasonably well, but ultimately he's going to get down to here and he is going to take a few, this is the only thing on Rob's turn that goes moderately bad, is that he, my, remember my turret is here. He is going to take a couple of orders to kill my turret and um, Emily, uh, and he's going to die in the process. Finally, there's going to be a bunch of shuffling around, and Rob will try and lay down some pitches. He'll be firing them at long range for most of his guns, uh, but this is a core length of five troopers, so they'll have plus one ballistic skill. And so we have both Pywell and the Fuerback uh, pitches. They're going to spend a lot of time laying them down, but ultimately they will only be able to land one, but they will be able to land it there. And then there is an attempt to spotlight the Dactari, and with two attempts with Zoe, he doesn't land spotlight. So that's a pretty rough first turn. Um, I'm down both of my big guns. Uh, so if we think about the, the casualties, it's significant, right? I've lost, uh, what have we lost? We've lost 30 something, 30 something, 30 something. Uh, yeah, okay, so we lost, we've lost about 100 points of my 250 point list and 50 points isn't even on the table. So right now this is, I've got about 100 points worth of stuff on the table to begin with, but we have a crack. So I know a few things, basically there are a few things that I can do here, and I'm going to try and do two things with my very limited order pool. I'm going to try and attack with those Hellcats, and I'm going to try and engage in some force reconstitution. I can't bring my reinforcements on, even though I would, I'm down 50 points, because it's below, uh, it's not turn two yet. Although, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure I would necessarily want to bring them on yet. Because if I bring them on now, they'll only, they'll, only, they'll only do so much, and they will be exposed to counterattack by Rob's reinforcements. There is kind of a second mouse get the cheese vibe that I'm beginning to notice with this, and and it is interesting how vulnerable reinforcements can be to counter assault by reinforcements. So our efforts are going to meet with limited success here. Uh, I don't necessarily do everything in the right order because I'm kind of figuring out things as I go. But what we are going to accomplish um, is we're going to land both Hellcats. Uh, the first Hellcat is going to try and take is going to what's it going to do? It's going to try and take this fight here um, against 
so, so it lands and Pywell stands. So it puts uh, two boarding shotgun templates into Pywell and knocks him unconscious. He'll be back next turn and he gets stunned and spotlighted for his efforts. The second one then lands and pops around here and puts uh, shotgun shots into the Cyclone and the Moderator on ground floor, but gets killed and kills neither of them. Doesn't break armor with either, uh, either shotgun template. Okay. Perhaps I should have done something else differently. What we do is we will risk at this point. I wanted to just try and doctor Nelf, but instead we will move the Daktari back. We'll fire a um, Medikit into Nelf. We'll actually bring Nelf back. That's really nice. We'll reform the link and Nelf in active turn. Harris link Nelf, very nice. Um, puts a whole bunch of shots into the Cyclone, forces I think six saves, and that puts the Cyclone all the way to dead, which means no recovery by Zoe. So that's good. However, we have perishingly few orders left at that point and all we're able to accomplish. Because again, like I lost so much on the first turn and I had two drop troops not on the table, not generating orders, had to use their orders to land. So all we're able to do is jump uh, Avicenna up to here and then move out and away and recover that riot goal. So Avicenna ends the turn standing on this rooftop. Um, I've Technically speaking, I've recovered now and I've recovered the riot goal, albeit wounded, but I've lost a... Um, uh, what should we call it? I've lost a Hellcat, and the other Hellcat is stunned and spotlit, and then it's going to go into Rob's turn too, and because I already killed, right? Because because Brando Castro is 30-something 30, 30 points, and Pywell is 19, it's like, cool, I, I can't not trigger reinforcements. Rob's reinforcements are going to arrive. Uh, so I don't actually have a photograph of round two. I, my photo seemed to have failed to take a camera, a photo of that. Um, camera seemed to take a failed to take a photo of that. But what has happened is uh, Rob will basically continue to push the offensive. His reinforcements will land in this space here um, with the beacon going down somewhere like that. And they, they ran as a link. Uh, we're not exactly sure how linkability and availability of link teams will be applied in reinforcements. But for this game, what we're assuming is that they will just, if you can form a Harris, if you have a spare Harris under the sectoral that you are playing, you can form up a Harris or a core or whatever using your reinforcements. So in Rob's list, he has an unused Harris. So when they deploy, he forms up a Harris out of the Stempler and the um, Cyclone and etc. Uh, and uh, basically what will happen for the remainder of this turn is that I will just continue to get my stuff killed. Um, the Cyclone will be recovered, but no, so the Cyclone is down. It kills, so I took now out last turn. I got recovered, he recovered. Um, the uh, Stigmaton will do most of the work. The Stigmaton will put, it'll knock... Um, Avicenna prone, she'll go, she'll guts, it will kill the riot girl in one go, uh, it will kill Nauf in one go, uh, it will kill the Daktari in one go by vaulting up onto here and then back down, uh, and that's that's pretty good for three orders, all things considered. Uh, he'll then lay a bunch of, he'll move this link team basically all the way up here to lay some pitches. Uh, Rob's bad luck with pitches will continue, but he'll lay one here, which is basically important. And then he'll pull the link team back. And that actually, I think, is very, very smart because I just mentioned that the, at least based on what we know right now, reinforcement pools, the first reinforcement pool to arrive is very likely to be very vulnerable to your opponent's reinforcement pools. And so what Rob has done here is he has set up conditions where it's very difficult for me to attack his reinforcements. There are a bunch of repeaters, right? So we're going to have like, there's going to be the Stempler, the Cyclone there, the Stempler there, the KHD here, and the repeater here, which means that pretty much all of this area is under repeater coverage. So I can't just like land a digger and an anaconda on him and expect it to do anything uh, the second that it activates. And so what that means is that when my reinforcements arrive, they're actually going to arrive down here instead. Uh, we're going to bring on the uh, the CSU here, the brawler hacker up here, um, the digger, and this is going to be the best part of the reinforcement pool. The digger is going to actually arrive inside this building uh, and the anaconda is going to come down here. And this is where we get to see actually the potential power if, if there are um, impetuous activations in, uh, in a reinforcement pool, that's potentially really good because I'm able to position this digger. I have to eyeball it, but I'm pretty good at eyeballing impetuous at this stage. And I'm able to put the digger down in a position where with his impetuous order, he comes around here and he's, he's able to get in without seeing a stigmaton. He's able to, as his impetuous order, catch both a ground floor moderator and a standing top floor Pywell, and he gets oblivioned and carbonated for his trouble because Pywell is a repeater, but he puts down both Pywell and the moderator. And that means I don't have to fight Pywell, which is really good because the only thing I'd really trust to do it at this point is Nauf, and Nauf is unconscious without a doctor nearby. 
And yeah, I've been totally mobility killed by you know various different things um, when I make this run. But that was an impetuous order, which is which means it's it's basically free, um, and the anaconda is now free to do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, unfortunately, it's an anaconda, which means that it sucks, so it does nothing. But you know, if it had been a good model, it might have done a bunch of things. What it actually does is it spends uh, like basically the entire reinforcement order pool trying to fight the stigmaton. The stigmaton has moved to about here. It's sort of standing there. The anaconda has come down there. And so it's within 24. Uh, I'm burst four on 13s. It's burst one on 13s with the rocket. And that's actually not a fantastic face-to-face -face roll. Like, it's not bad. The, the stigmaton is, sorry, the um, anaconda is likely to win. And it's likely to win pretty consistently, but it's not likely to win by a ton. It's just BS-13. Uh, if you think about that, that's usually going to be two or three hits on average, of which it's pretty likely that one or two will be cancelled by the stigmaton. And indeed, that's what happened. I think I landed one hit every single time, and it's only damage 15 AP. Stigmaton is still a tag in cover, so it just did zero damage. Uh, that was the entire reinforcement pool activity. Not fantastic. Would have liked to have done literally anything. Uh, literally anything would have been good. Um, as it was, I did nothing. But, uh, you know, we can't all... It's not a conda. I don't have anything else to say in its defense. Uh, with its last order, it gave up trying to fight the stigmaton because uh, it had done zero wounds and just went into suppressive in order to try and basically keep itself alive over the course of the rest of the game. Uh, obviously, my first combat group was shot to shot to hell by this stage. Uh, I know it did some things, but I don't really remember what they are. I think it tried to kill. Uh, no, in a moment of desperation, because I really I had like three or four orders to spend. Um, I'm reaching into the. I'm looking for my outs here. I'm trying to find like what are the things that I can do that can recover the game. And uh, I attempt. Actually, I face check the repeater that landed over here in an attempt to just like. Uhahu has two wounds. I can risk a trinity, and I just split burst oblivion, and I don't accomplish anything. Uh, oh well, look, it was worth trying. I don't get oblivioned myself, and so she guts us out of the repeater area. It was worth a shot. That's about all that I can accomplish this turn. Now, just to pause here, um, this whole turn that has just played out, there was an alternate line of play, and I actually discussed it with Rob before I played the turn. And it comes down to whether or not reinforcements are optional or mandatory. Because I took quite a lot of damage on my first and on over the course of Rob's first two turns. The amount of stuff that he killed comfortably put me below a 75 point retreat threshold. And this is a 300 point game. I have a 250 point army, but 250 points slash 100 points of reinforcements is a 300 point game based on how they've described the equivalencies. Reinforcements land before the retreat check, but if you have the option, if you've taken 50 points of casualties and reinforcements at that point can optionally land but don't have to, I could have just not landed my reinforcements gone into retreat and won the game by a small margin because I had some things in zones and Rob didn't. He'd pulled back to avoid a reinforcement counterattack. And that's really interesting. Now, we talked it out and we basically, one, that would have been a very anticlimactic end to the game if that had been something that can do you can do. And two, it's potentially very gameable if um, if that's something that can happen. Like, you're going to have to be really careful. If you attack hard into a 250-point list, it's very easy to do, what's that, 175 points worth of damage. Um, 175 points worth of damage is like a little more than half of a usual 300-point list. And against a 250-point list, which might struggle to defend, that sounds like it's pretty easy to do. So there is a, like, we're going to have to just pay attention to is is reinforcement landing optional or mandatory in round two if you suffer the casualties? And if it is optional, how does that interact with the retreat rules? What actually is the, how, how does that work? What are the retreat thresholds, etc.? I think it's probably most likely that reinforcements are mandatory to land, which means that they do turn up and prevent the game from going into retreat. But that is just something that's interesting to think about. Something to keep an eye on when the rules drop on the third. Uh, so anyway, here's the game at the beginning of round three. And really, this is just mop-up mode for Rob. Uh, the Anaconda is not going to go down this game, uh, but he just moves things forward. He kills um, the majority of my remaining pieces that are around. Uh, there's not 
a lot more to it. He doesn't need to place any more repeaters. He just needs to get into zones and do classifieds. He's able to do um, net undermine. He's done test run already. He's done, I think he may have had telemetry, um, but he does the remaining classifieds that he needs to do this game. He's got three classifieds. He's exchanged one for Intelcom. I've gone with all four, but I will only be able to do sabotage because too much of my stuff is dead. And then we pass on to my last turn. And I basically spend this time wondering if there's anything resembling an out. Uh, and I have I have like a couple of incredibly long odds plays that I attempt to make. Um, the isolated digger that is hanging out back here, it got isolated by this repeater. Uh, it had guts out of the repeater area. It spends, it does not impetuous, but it sends its irregular order to long bomb a grenade. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention what booty it rolled. The digger with chain rifles and grenades rolled grenades for its booty, uh, as is customary. It rolled a long bomb grenade into Rob's link team that's moved up to this space here, but it doesn't land it. I mean, not surprising. I think I needed a three. Uh, next in the list of desperation plays is the Uha who once again face checks the repeater, and she double zots total control into through the repeater into the stigmaton. She actually has total control plus two damage, uh, and if I succeed on this, and I'll knock basically like almost 60 points out of the middle zone, which is potentially really, really valuable. Uh, but she does not succeed on that, and in fact, she gets carbonated and oblivion for her efforts. Finally, we have, like at that point, things are basically done. With a couple of orders, the Anaconda moves around here and tries to kill uh, a couple of Rob's remotes that are in this area. And after two orders, it does succeed in a really long bomb out of cover shot against the Stempler and takes it down. But that's all that it can accomplish. And the remainder of my turn is just the al Hawa moving around here and uh, in a moment of defiance, planting a bomb on this um, on this planter bed and scoring me sabotage. So with the uh, the Anaconda ultimately pulling back to here, that does give me my zone. So I have two points, um, one from classified, one from the zone, and Rob has all of the remaining points that you can score. Uh, it's going to be something like three for his classifieds, plus two for the middle zone, plus one for his zone. Uh, so six points, getting over the five point threshold into the offensive bonus. Uh, so that's a uh, two six in Stark in Star in Bakunin's way, um, and that's that's the game. And if you made it this far into the battle report, that does actually bring us to uh, the third reason why I played this list and Starco this evening, which is uh, I don't often read the discords, but I was tagged in a comment a couple of days ago, and I saw someone make the comment about one of my videos, basically saying, "Boy, it sure would be nice if Rob ever posts a game where he loses," uh, and that's that's fair enough. Um, I have posted every tournament. I've posted a report for every tournament I've attended for something like the last two years, um, and I have not left out a single game. And in those, I mean, you can draw your own conclusions basically about sort of win loss records and competitive play from that. It's kind of self explanatory. Um, but I do absolutely lose games when I'm mucking around or trying out jank stuff and just exploring things. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, for example, I've had some games with Toha where, in order, I tried a list where I cut out half of the smoke and all of the end game from a Toha list. Uh, it turns out that's really bad. I actually didn't miss the end game that much, but I really missed the smoke. Um, playing without enough mirror ball and eclipse grenades is just way too challenging. Uh, and then I tried a Toha list where I didn't take a single symbiomate or symbiobomb, and that actually turned out to be way more viable than I expected. And you try this stuff, right? You try out things, and it's when, you, when you're reaching deep into the jank tank that you, you lose games, right? You have to try and play things. You have to experiment with stuff to learn what's good and what's bad. Uh, this evening, listen, this is one game and deeply non-conclusive because we don't know what Starco, Starco's comlinks will be like. We don't know what the reinforcement profiles for contracted backup will be like. Uh, they could be much better suited to being reinforcements than just like the profiles that are currently available to Brawlers and CSU, which are kind of mediocre, or Anacondas, which are deeply mediocre. Um, there could be something in there. There could be a totally new Anaconda profile that's like, oh wow, that's super well suited to playing a reinforcement tag. It's basically like a really big, really expensive, good heavy infantry. Awesome. Um, so this game is very much non-conclusive, but it has not driven me to play uh, to play Starco again at any time particularly soon. And it has actually highlighted just kind of once again how building for reinforcements is going to be really interesting but really challenging and like how important it's going to be just to have like comlink plus ones and comlink plus two scattered across different armies so that you can do things like 
just take a couple of Jaguars and a hard case. Um, if I'd been able to put those in this, th those in this list in a in place of like one of the Hellcats, for example, um, I would have been in, in such a more comfortable defensive position. And in part, that's because I'm used to using things like that defensively. But like also, again, like you, you need to have things to defend with. Uh, I'm sure more qualified Starco players could tell me ways I could have changed and improved my list. Absolutely. Um, definitely room for improvement there. And in any case, this is all very highly speculative. But regardless, there you go. There is a game <laughs> There is a game that I have lost, uh, thoroughly, no less. Not a, not a narrow victory, 2-6 uh, Bakunin's way, uh, but still a very good, very interesting, very knowledge-forward game. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you next time.